Book 2, Chapter 6, The Right of Property Here is an institution of the ancients of which we must not form an idea from anything that we see around us. The ancients founded the right of property on principles different from those of the present generation. As a result, the laws by which they guaranteed it are sensibly different from ours. We know that there are races who have never succeeded in establishing among themselves the right of private property, while others have reached this stage only after long and painful experience. It is not indeed an easy problem in the origin of society to decide whether the individual may appropriate the soil and establish such a bond between his being and a portion of the earth that he can say, this land is mine, this is the same as a part of me. The Tartars have an idea of the right of property in the case of flocks or herds, but they cannot understand it when it is a question of land. Among the ancient Germans, the earth belonged to no one. Every year the tribe assigned to each one of its members a lot to cultivate, and the lot was changed the following year. The German was proprietor of the harvest, but not of the land. The case is still the same among a part of the Semitic race, and among some of the Slavic nations. On the other hand, the nations of Greece and Italy, from the earliest antiquity, always held to the idea of private property. We do not find an age when the soil was common among them, nor do we find anything that resembles the annual allotment of land which was in vogue among the Germans. And here we note a remarkable fact. While the races that do not accord to the individual a property in the soil allow him at least a right to the fruits of his labor, that is to say, to his harvest, precisely the contrary custom prevailed among the Greeks. In many cities the citizens were required to store their crops in common, or at least the greater part, and to consume them in common. The individual, therefore, was not the master of the corn which he had gathered, but at the same time, by a singular contradiction, he had an absolute property in the soil. To him the land was more than the harvest. It appears that among the Greeks the conception of private property was developed exactly contrary to what appears to be the natural order. It was not applied to the harvest first and to the soil afterwards, but followed the inverse order. There are three things which, from the most ancient times, we find founded and solidly established in these Greek and Italian societies, the domestic religion, the family, and the right of property, three things which had in the beginning a manifest relation, and which appear to have been inseparable. The idea of private property existed in the religion itself. Every family had its hearth and its ancestors. These gods could be adored only by this family and protected it alone. They were its property. Now between these gods and the soil, men of the early ages saw a mysterious relation. Let us first take the hearth. This altar is the symbol of a sedentary life. Its name indicates this. It must be placed upon the ground. Once established, it cannot be moved. The god of the family wishes to have a fixed abode. Materially, it is difficult to transport the stone on which he shines. Religiously, this is more difficult still, and is permitted to a man only when hard necessity presses him, when an enemy is pursuing him, or when the soil cannot support him. When they establish the hearth, it is with the thought and hope that it will always remain in the same spot. The god is installed there not for a day, not for the life of one man merely, but for as long a time as this family shall endure, and there remains any one to support its fire by sacrifices. Thus the sacred fire takes possession of the soil and makes it its own. It is the God's property. And the family, which through duty and religion remains grouped around its altar, is as much fixed to the soil as the altar itself. The idea of domicile follows naturally. The family is attached to the altar. The altar is attached to the soil. An intimate relation, therefore, is established between the soil and the family. There must be his permanent home, which he will not dream of quitting, unless an unforeseen necessity constrains him to it. 
Like the hearth, it will always occupy this spot. This spot belongs to it, is its property, the property not simply of a man, but of a family, whose different members must, one after another, be born and die here. Let us follow the idea of the ancients. Two sacred fires represent two distinct divinities, who are never united or confounded. This is so true that even intermarriage between two families does not establish an alliance between their gods. The sacred fire must be isolated, that is to say, completely separated from all that is not of itself. The stranger must not approach it at the moment when the ceremonies of the worship are performed, or even be in sight of it. It is for this reason that these gods are called the concealed gods, Mishi, or the interior gods, Penates. In order that this religious rule may be well observed, there must be an enclosure around this hearth at a certain distance. It did not matter whether this enclosure was a hedge, a wall of wood, or one of stone. Whatever it was, it marked the limit which separated the domain of one sacred fire from that of another. This enclosure was deemed sacred. It was an impious act to pass it. The god watched over it and kept it under his care. They therefore applied to this god the epithet of Irhios. This enclosure, traced and protected by religion, was the most certain emblem, the most undoubted mark of the right of property. Let us return to the primitive ages of the Aryan race. The sacred enclosure, which the Greeks call Iohos, and the Latins Herctum, was the somewhat spacious enclosure in which the family had its house, its flocks, and the small field that it cultivated. In the midst rose the protecting fire god. Let us descend to the succeeding ages. The tribes have reached Greece and Italy, and have built cities. The dwellings are brought nearer together. They are not, however, contiguous. The sacred enclosure still exists, but is of smaller proportions. Oftenest it is reduced to a low wall, a ditch, a furrow, or to a mere open space a few feet wide. But in no case could two houses be joined to each other. A party wall was supposed to be an impossible thing. The same wall could not be common to two houses, for then the sacred enclosure of the gods would have disappeared. At Rome, the law fixed two feet and a half as the width of the free space, which was always to separate two houses, and this space was consecrated to the god of the enclosure. A result of these old religious rules was that a community of property was never established among the ancients. A phalanstery was never known among them. Even Pythagoras did not succeed in establishing institutions which the most intimate religion of men resisted. Neither do we find at any epoch in the life of the ancients anything that resembled that multitude of villages so general in France during the twelfth century. Every family having its gods and its worship was required to have its particular place on the soil, its isolated domicile, its property. According to the Greeks, the sacred fire taught men to build houses, and indeed men who were fixed by their religion to one spot, which they believed it their duty not to quit, would soon begin to think of raising in that place some solid structure. The tent covers the Arab, the wagon the Tartar, but a family that has a domestic hearth has need of a permanent dwelling. The stone house soon succeeds the mud cabin or the wooden hut, the family did not build for the life of a single man, but for generations that were to succeed each other in the same dwelling. The house was always placed in the sacred enclosure. Among the Greeks, the square which composed the enclosure was divided into two parts. The first part was the court, the house occupied the second. The hearth, placed near the middle of the whole enclosure, was thus at the bottom of the court, and near the entrance of the house. At Rome the disposition was different, but the principle was the same. The hearth remained in the middle of the enclosure, but the buildings rose round it on four sides, so as to enclose it with a little court. We can easily understand the idea that inspired this system of construction. The walls are raised around the hearth to isolate and defend it, and we may say, as the Greeks said, 
that religion taught men to build houses. In this house the family is master and proprietor, its domestic divinity assures it this right. The house is consecrated by the perpetual presence of gods. It is a temple which preserves them. What is there more holy, says Cicero, what is there more carefully fenced round with every description of religious respect than the house of each individual citizen? Here is his altar, here is his hearth, here are his household gods. Here all his sacred rites, all his religious ceremonies are preserved. To enter this house with any malevolent intention was a sacrilege. The domicile was inviolable. According to a Roman tradition, the domestic god repulsed the robber and kept off the enemy. Let us pass to another object of worship, the tomb, and we shall see that the same ideas were attached to this. The tomb held a very important place in the religion of the ancients, for, on one hand, worship was due to the ancestors, and on the other, the principal ceremony of this worship, the funeral repast, was to be performed on the very spot where the ancestors rested. The family, therefore, had a common tomb, where its members, one after another, must come to sleep. For this tomb the rule was the same as for the hearth. It was no more permitted to unite two families in the same tomb than it was to establish two domestic hearths in the same house. To bury one out of the family tomb, or to place a stranger in this tomb, was equally impious. The domestic religion, both in life and in death, separated every family from all others, and strictly rejected all appearances of community. Just as the houses could not be contiguous, so the tombs could not touch each other. Each one of them, like the house, had a sort of isolating enclosure. How manifest is the character of private property in all this? The dead are gods, who belong to a particular family, which alone has the right to invoke them. These gods have taken possession of the soil. They live under this little mound, and no one, except one of the family, can think of meddling with them. Furthermore, no one has the right to dispossess them of the soil which they occupy. A tomb among the ancients could never be destroyed or displaced. This was forbidden by the severest laws. Here, therefore, was a portion of the soil which, in the name of religion, became an object of perpetual property for each family. The family appropriated to itself this soil by placing its dead here. It was established here for all time. The living scion of this family could rightly say, This land is mine. It was so completely his that it was inseparable from him, and he had not the right to dispose of it. The soil where the dead rested was inalienable and imprescriptible. The Roman law required that, if a family sold the field where the tomb was situated, it should still retain the ownership of this tomb, and should always preserve the right to cross the field in order to perform the ceremonies of its worship. The ancient usage was to inter the dead, not in cemeteries or by the roadside, but in the field belonging to the family. This custom of ancient times is attested by a law of Solon, and by several passages in Plutarch. We learn from an oration of Demosthenes that even in his time, each family buried its dead in its own field, and that when a domain was bought in Attica, the burial place of the old proprietors was found there. As for Italy, this same custom is proved to have existed by the laws of the Twelve Tables, by passages from two jurist consults, and by this sentence of Siccius Flaccus. Anciently, there were two ways of placing the tomb. Some placed it on one side of the field, others towards the middle. From this custom we can see that the idea of property was easily extended from the small mound to the field that surrounded this mound. In the works of the elder Cato, there is a formula according to which the Italian laborer prayed the manis to watch over his field, to take good care against the thief, and to bless him with a good harvest. Thus these souls of the dead extended tutelary action, and with it their right of property, even to the boundaries of the domain. Through them the family was sole master in this field, 
the tomb had established an indissoluble union of the family with the land, that of ownership. In the greater number of primitive societies, the right of property was established by religion. In the Bible, the Lord said to Abraham, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees, to give thee this land to inherit it. And to Moses, Go up hence into the land which I swear unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, Unto thee will I give it. Thus God, the primitive proprietor, by right of creation, delegates to man his ownership over a part of the soil. There was something analogous among the ancient Greco-Italian peoples. It was not the religion of Jupiter that founded this right, it is true, perhaps because this religion did not yet exist. The gods who conferred upon every family its right to a portion of the soil were the domestic gods, the sacred fire, and the manas. The first religion that exercised its empire on their minds was also the one that established the right of property among them. It is clearly evident that private property was an institution that the domestic religion had need of. This religion required that both dwellings and burying places should be separable from each other. Living in common was therefore impossible. The same religion required that the hearth should be fixed to the soil that the tomb should neither be destroyed nor displaced. Suppress the right of property, and the sacred fire would be without a fixed place. The families would become confounded, and the dead would be abandoned and without worship. By the stationary hearth and the permanent burial place, the family took possession of the soil. The earth was in some sort imbued and penetrated by the religion of the hearth and of the ancestors. Thus the men of the early ages were saved the trouble of resolving too difficult a problem. Without discussion, without labor, without a shadow of hesitation, they arrived at a single step, and merely by virtue of their belief, at a conception of the right of property, this right from which all civilization springs, since by it man improves the soil and becomes improved himself. Religion, and not laws, first guaranteed the right of property. Every domain was under the eyes of household divinities, who watched over it. Every field had to be surrounded, as we have seen, for the house, by an enclosure, which separated it completely from the domains of other families. This enclosure was not a wall of stone, it was a band of soil a few feet wide, which remained uncultivated, and which the plow could never touch. This space was sacred. The Roman law declared it indefeasible. It belonged to the religion. On certain appointed days of each month and year, the father of the family went round his field, following this line. He drove victims before him, sang hymns, and offered sacrifices. By this ceremony he believed he had awakened the benevolence of his gods towards his field and his house. Above all, he had marked his right of property by proceeding round his field with his domestic worship. The path which the victims and prayers had followed was the inviolable limit of the domain. On this line, at certain points, the men placed large stones or trunks of trees, which they called termini. We can form a good idea as to what these bounds were, and what ideas were connected with them, by the manner in which the piety of men established them. This, says Seculus Flaccus, was the manner in which our ancestors proceeded. They commenced by digging a small hole and placing the terminus upright near it. Next, they crowned the terminus with garlands of grasses and flowers. Then they offered a sacrifice. The victim being immolated, they made the blood flow into the hole. They threw in live coals, kindled probably at the sacred fire of the hearth, grain, cakes, fruits, a little wine, and some honey. When all this was consumed in the hole, they thrust down the stone or piece of wood upon the ashes while they were still warm. It is easy to see that the object of the ceremony was to make of this terminus a sort of sacred representation of the domestic worship. To continue this character for it, they renewed the sacred act every year by pouring out libations and reciting prayers. The terminus, once placed in the earth, became in some sort, the domestic religion implanted in the soil, to indicate that this soil was forever the property of the family. Later, poetry lending its aid, 
the terminus was considered a distinct god. The employment of termini, or sacred bounds for fields, appears to have been universal among the Indo-European race. It existed among the Hindus at a very early date, and the sacred ceremonies of the boundaries had among them a great analogy with those which Siculus Flaccus has described for Italy. Before the foundation of Rome, we find the terminus among the Sabines. We also find it among the Etruscans. The Hellenes, too, had sacred landmarks, which they called Ori Thei Ori. The terminus once established according to the required rites, there was no power on earth that could displace it. It was to remain in the same place through all ages. This religious principle was expressed at Rome by a legend. Jupiter, having wished to prepare himself a site on the Capitoline Hill for a temple, could not displace the god Terminus. This old tradition shows how sacred property had become, for the immovable Terminus signified nothing less than inviolable property. In fact, the Terminus guarded the limit of the field and watched over it. A neighbor dared not approach too near it. For then, says Ovid, the god who felt himself struck by the plowshare or mattock cried, Stop! This is my field! There is yours. To encroach upon the field of a family, it was necessary to overturn or displace a boundary mark, and this boundary mark was a god. The sacrilege was horrible, and the chastisement severe. According to the old Roman law, the man and the oxen who touched a terminus were devoted, that is to say, both man and oxen were immolated in expiation. The Etruscan law, speaking in the name of religion, says, He who shall have touched or displaced a bound shall be condemned by the gods, his house shall disappear, his race shall be extinguished, his land shall no longer produce fruits, hail, rust, and the fires of the dog star shall destroy his harvests, the limbs of the guilty one shall be covered with ulcers and shall waste away. We do not possess the text of the Athenian law on this subject. There remains of it only three words which signify do not pass the boundaries. But Plato appears to complete the thought of the legislator when he says, Our first law ought to be this. Let no person touch the bounds which separate his field from that of his neighbor, for this ought to remain immovable. Let no one attempt to disturb the small stone which separates friendship from enmity, and which the landowners have bound themselves by an oath to leave in its place. From all these beliefs, from all these usages, from all these laws, it clearly follows that the domestic religion taught man to appropriate the soil, and assured him his right to it. There is no difficulty in understanding that the right of property, having been thus conceived and established, was much more complete and absolute in its effects than it can be in our modern societies, where it is founded upon other principles. Property was so inherent in the domestic religion that a family could not renounce one without renouncing the other. The house and the field were, so to speak, incorporated in it, and it could neither lose them nor dispose of them. Plato, in his treatise on the laws, did not pretend to advance a new idea when he forbade the proprietor to sell his field. He did no more than to recall an old law. Everything leads us to believe that in the ancient ages property was inalienable. It is well known that at Sparta the citizen was formally forbidden to sell his lot of land. There was the same interdiction in the laws of Locri and of Leucadia. Phaedon of Corinth, a legislator of the 9th century BC, prescribed that the number of families and of estates should remain unchangeable. Now this prescription could be observed only when it was forbidden to sell an estate, or even to divide it. The law of Solon, later by seven or eight generations than that of Phaedon of Corinth, no longer forbade a man to sell his land, but punished the vendor by a severe fine and the loss of the rights of citizenship. Finally, Aristotle mentions, in a general manner, that in many cities the ancient laws forbade the sale of land. Such laws ought not to surprise us. Found property on the right of labor, and a man may dispose of it. Found it on religion, and he can no longer do this, 
a tie stronger than the will of man binds the land to him. Besides, this field where the tomb is situated, where the divine ancestors live, where the family is forever to perform its worship, is not simply the property of a man, but of a family. It is not the individual actually living who has established his right over this soil. It is the domestic god. The individual has it in trust only. It belongs to those who are dead, and to those who are not yet to be born. It is a part of the body of this family, and cannot be separated from it. To detach one from the other is to alter a worship, to offend a religion. Among the Hindus, property, also founded upon religion, was also inalienable. We know nothing of Roman law previous to the laws of the Twelve Tables. It is certain that at that time the sale of property was permitted, but there are reasons for thinking that in the earlier days of Rome, and in Italy before the existence of Rome, land was inalienable, as in Greece. Though there remains no evidence of this old law, there remains to us at least the modifications which were made in it by degrees. The law of the Twelve Tables, though attaching to the tomb the character of inalienability, has freed the soil from it. Afterwards it was permitted to divide property, if there were several brothers, but on condition that a new religious ceremony should be performed, and that the new partition should be made by a priest. Religion only could divide what had before been proclaimed indivisible. Finally, it was permitted to sell the domain, but for that formalities of a religious character were also necessary. This sale could take place only in the presence of a priest, whom they called Libripens, and with the sacred formality, which they called mancipation. Something analogous is seen in Greece. The sale of a house or of land was always accompanied with a sacrifice to the gods. Every transfer of property needed to be authorized by religion. If a man could not, or could only with difficulty dispose of land, for a still stronger reason he could not be deprived of it against his will. The appropriation of land for public utility was unknown among the ancients. Confiscation was resorted to only in case of condemnation to exile. That is to say, when a man, deprived of his right to citizenship, could no longer exercise any right over the soil of the city. Nor was the taking of property for debt known in the ancient laws of cities. The laws of the Twelve Tables assuredly do not spare the debtor. Still, they do not permit his property to be sold for the benefit of the creditor. The body of the debtor is held for the debt, not his land, for the land is inseparable from the family. It is easier to subject a man to servitude than to take his property from him. The debtor is placed in the hands of the creditor. His land follows him in some sort into slavery. The master who uses the physical strength of a man for his own profit enjoys at the same time the fruits of his land, but does not become the proprietor of it. So inviolable above all else is the right of property.